everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Johanna Rothman. Hi Johanna. Hi Joanna, it's so nice to be here, thank you. Oh no, it's great to have you on the show and uh, we hung out in Oregon a while back but just an introduction for everyone else. Johanna is a management consultant for software managers and leaders specialising in agile project management and she is known as the pragmatic manager. She's a professional speaker and author of 12 non-fiction books as well as short stories and romance. And today we're talking about business plans for authors and how writing writers can manage projects more effectively. And I got to just heads up, everyone, don't turn off. Johanna is, is great and not, the, it's like I was saying to you before we start recording, you're just not like your introduction at all. <laughs> Do you get that a lot? <laughs> um, <laughs> sort of. I get the fact people always say to me when they meet me in person, you write so much taller than you are. So, <laughs> That's great. So for those of you who don't know, I'm five feet on an extremely good day. So I... You know, and I've never been any taller. And and I always include humor in my writing, but I write about serious stuff. So I don't I don't actually have any humor in my bio, which maybe I should change. I think I think you should because that's what I really liked about you is you bring your humor into these topics that can sound quite businessy and kind of languagey. You know, there's so much jargon in this area. But just tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. So I am not a writer by nature. I believe, so you've had journals for years, right? I've been listening to you for years on the podcast. I mean. Yeah, it's so exciting to be here. Okay, so um, I am not a writer by nature. I'm a talker. I'm one of those extroverts that every every introverted writer mm, is not so excited about because I not I'm not altogether sure what I'm thinking until I actually say it out loud. So when I started my consulting business, I got my father-in-law gave me, I believe it was called Howard Jensen's Guide to Consulting Success. It was a self-published three-ring binder, and on like the second page or something, he said, consultants who write and speak make more than $100,000 a year. Consultants who don't write and speak make $30,000 a year. Wow. I mean, this is a no-brainer, write and speak. So I started with the speaking, and then I, I, I kept on with the writing, and I got a monthly uh, column for Software Development Magazine. That was back in 97, mm. and then I, start, I, I had more writing. We, we wrote mostly in paper back then. <laughs> I know. It just seems astonishing, and, and the deadlines were so long, and... I would send in a column and it would take months for it to come out. And then I started my blogs in 2003. So I've been writing very regularly since 2003. But it's not something I I grew up wanting to do. If you'd asked me, I would have said, I want to be paid to read for a living. Mm -hmm. And this is this is actually as close as you can get. Yeah, I agree with you. I think, and I wrote that down too. When I when I wanted to get out of consulting, I wrote down, I want to read and write and travel. That's my ideal life. So, and I see all the, those people who aren't on the video, all these books behind you, which are, you know, you've obviously got a big library. Um, so, well, I just want to also point out for people just on audio, you said you started blogging there in 2003. And, um, you know, without asking your age, you are you are more on the more mature end of, <laughs> of the... I'm so for God's sake, I'm 62. <laughs> well, why, I'm just... why I wanted to ask you, because is you are a technical person. And like you said, you've been writing since 2003. And so many people, even like I get millennials. My sister said to me the other day, and she's like 31. Oh, I just can't understand computers. So I wondered if you would give some perspective on um, technology and age and the kind of things that people that the, the excuses that people put up around it. So yeah, if there's a reason not to do something, people will make a reason. Um, I'm actually just running a blog post right now about this very question, not specifically technology, but you and I have a couple of colleagues who are digital nomads. They, they travel the world and write. 
I know some people who actually travel the world in code. And I, I was thinking to myself, I could never do that. And I thought, why the hell not? I mean, sorry. Um, why the heck not? So I mean, why, what prevents me now? I have a husband who would, who has a real job. So I would have to figure out what to do with him. Um, which means bring him along, not leave him behind. <laughs> so, I mean, but I, I think that all of those excuses are fear mm-hmm. and we, we have a lot of fear in this world. We have a fear personally, um, for anything new and not that everybody has a fear of everything new, but every so often we look at things and we say, Oh, I can't do that. Yeah. I think that that's fear and, and we have choices. So the question is, do we want to get over that fear and allow that thing into our lives Hmm. or do we want to say, you know, maybe not. Yeah. And I think, and and using that fear, you know, I wanted you to come on the podcast because there was a session at the Oregon Business Workshop, which actually I think had business in the title. And when we talked about business plans, you and I were looking at each other, you know, across the room, just going, why are people not getting that? So do you, th- why do you think that people in the more creative, you know, writing space have a fear around the business side? So I think that they hear us maybe talk about spreadsheets and they totally freak out. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you and I both know Matt Buckman, who has this really intricate writing spreadsheet. Oh, my goodness. I fixed that. I it's much my writing spreadsheet is much simpler than his because I only want to know what my what my writing totals are. I don't do all this other stuff. And I have found that because I'm not afraid to change something, I get more out of it. And, and for everyone thinks, oh, you need a Gantt chart. Oh, I've been managing projects since 19... I've never used a Gantt chart, never in my entire life. I hope never to have to use it. I th- I find them unreadable and unworkable. Now. There are lots of people who love their Gantt charts. And I think that when when we talk about plans, they think, oh, this big plan. And then how am I going to get to the details? I mean, you and I, I think, might plan the same way. I have one document that says, my strategy for this year is to make money doing these things. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then I track the money because – we are business owners and we have to track the revenue. Yes, we have to track the income and the outgo. And I'm, I have a very simple way of doing that. It's, it's addition and a spreadsheet will do that for me. (laughs) (laughs) I'm actually very fond of saying I cannot do arithmetic. I can only do math, right? Give me symbols. I'm a very happy woman. Make me do arithmetic. I feel like I'm in third grade again. Mm. Well, I, I'm definitely with you there. And um, Matt Buckman was on the podcast talking about the la- you know, the letter to your estate, um, if people estate planning. Um, but yeah, you're right. I, I don't even have a spreadsheet to track my my production. And my plan, similar to you, is uh, really just a kind of rolling one pager. Um, but we're going to come back to that. I do. Uh, l- let's just be really basic about a business plan then. So we've said like it might be a one pager, but but why is it important to even think like take yourself out of the detail like you said you could have a a a spreadsheet with tracking your words or scrivener or whatever but why is it important to take yourself up a level and look at the business as a whole so when i would this is what i actually teach my clients right when you are down in the weeds it's really hard to see where your business is going Mm -hmm. if you say I have a strategy this year of these kinds of workshops or these kinds of books or these kinds of speaking or these kinds of writing. Then you can actually look at it every month or. Here's what here's how I'm doing against my business. And so when I made the strategic decision to write more and travel less a few years ago, I actually had to say, how am I going to replace my income from speaking if I'm not traveling the world and I still do, but not as often, if I'm not traveling the world every couple of weeks, how am I going to make that money? And I, I better have a plan, not because 
I'm so money hungry, but because the work I do fulfills me. Right. So if I if I know why I'm working and I know what I need to do to have a reasonable income and have happiness, then right then I'm all set. But if I didn't write it down at least one page, I'm not sure if I would really make the right decisions. I think what's also interesting is we we forget why we made a decision. And if you if you write it down, then you remember. So one, I think this is really important at the moment in the indie community because, of course, there's the high production KU focused model. Then you've talked there about writing and speaking, and then there is the being a publisher, which some indies are getting into. There's the um, even things like Patreon about subscribers and that type of thing. So. If you make a decision, you might forget why you did something. Like for me, I'm never going to be KU high production because I'm not a high production type person. So when you made that decision to stop speaking, um, you know, did you examine the reasons why and write that down so you'd remember it later? Or, or how do you reflect on that over time? So we were going to get to this later, but yeah, the, we'll do the, it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The decision I made was because I have vertigo, and it's it's permanent. I have a rollator, um, and I I use the rollator, and I walk really fast with the rollator. But just getting on a plane and going somewhere, I get. Um, I, I like to call myself a dizzy broad when I land because I am literally dizzy, and I'm not so with it. So I really I. I do I do my best work when I'm with it, mm. no, not when I'm dizzy. So I really want to save my travel for those circumstances where it's really worth it, and it can be worth it in many, many different dimensions. Mm. But I really want to make sure it's worth it for me, it's worth it for my business, it's worth it for where I'm going. So I had an invitation to go to Sweden for one day. I'm in Boston. Mm -hmm. Now, you going to Sweden for a day, you know, you go to Heathrow, well, whatever, yeah. um, someplace, and you take a two and a half hour uh, plane ride, and you go, you're in Sweden, and it's fine, and you, you might go for a day, and you might actually stay overnight, I mean, but it's it's doable. I'm in Boston. That's not really doable. <laughs> no. I think even if I didn't have vertigo, it was not doable. Mm -hmm. So. So I think it's really important to say, what benefit do I do I get, right? What is the value for me? Hmm. What is the value for the other person? And when we start to think about value and not anything else, and it has to be a two-way thing, right? So you get a lot of value from having your books go wide and writing as you do. And you do, you get a lot of value from the podcast. You deliver a lot of value. So when we start to think about the value proposition, oh God, buzzword bingo. Yay! Um, <laughs> we knew we would do it at some point. Um, but when we think about value, we might make different decisions. So it's interesting there, you talk about value. And I think the, the other word is, is the kind of the consequences of our decisions, because that to me is so important with planning. It's like, okay, if you stop speaking, if you stop traveling for speaking, then your income will be affected, maybe three months down the line, or, you know, or whatever. Or if you pull all your books from wide and just go into KU, the impact will be that you're not building up an audience on these other platforms. So how can people really, when they're doing that, and we're really talking about strategy at this point, and we'll come back to the detail of the business plan, but how can people start to think about the consequences even months and years ahead in their strategy? Oh, that's such a good question. I, I think that the part of it is to say, what are the short-term benefits, I think, right? I mean, we could do pros and cons, mm. but I, I much prefer to think about the benefits and in the short term and the long term. So, for example, all of my books are wide also. I have them as many places as possible because people buy books because of the author's. Right. So they hear about you. They buy your books. They hear about me. Um, they read another piece of writing. They do something and they buy my books. So I want I want to make my books as available across the world as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that and that if you if you don't have a reputation yet, if you're still 
building your reputation, you might say, well, I'll be in KU for the next three months or six months or whatever it takes. And then I will see how many people I have on my mailing list. And we, I will see how many people, where I'm, how much I'm selling. And can I take the short-term hit of coming out of KU to go wine? And then what do I need to do as a strategy to get all those other people around the world hearing about me? Hmm. Right. So it's, it's short-term and long-term. And how do you, how do you integrate the two? And what, what happens when you have that inflection point of change? I think that one of the things that um, we often don't think about is in our little businesses, we have exactly the same kind of change that every other company does. We, when we change from doing things one way to another, we have we might have a decrease in sales, we mm. might have a decrease on our mailing list, and we are expecting some other result. So we will have a short-term change followed by a longer-term other status quo, right? But how we get from one place to another is part of our strategy. Yeah. And I think also the education, you know, circling back to what we said at the start, you know, say keeping up with technology that when you started blogging in 2003, I mean, it's it's almost unrecognizable what situation we're in now with with technology. And to me, that um, upskilling. So, for example, I'm I've been doing a lot on screenwriting. That mm -hmm. makes me zero money right now. And in fact, it costs me more money because I'm not putting, you know, I'm not putting that time into creating another book, for example. Um, but we take these dips in order to, to look towards the future. So, and it's, I, I just, you know, coming back on your decision around consulting. So you're a consultant and a, a speaker mm -hmm. and that's time for, that's money for time. Yes. How do how do you judge money for time versus money for building assets? And maybe explain what that means for people who might not understand. <laughs> so I have these books and I have workshops. And the nice thing about um, what I call the automated workshops is that I don't actually spend any time delivering them because I already recorded them. Right. And the books you've already written. And once they're out, they're out. And you can then write more to promote. But you have options as to how you continue to sell them. Mm -hmm. And I I long ago decided. In fact, I think it was my very first interview with somebody. I had an informational interview when he said at some point in consulting, if you stay in it long enough, mm -hmm. people are going to, you need to make a decision. How will you stop trading off time for money? So I started to think about that right away. And the nice thing about writing, as you well know, is you can collect things. So you can have collections um, in the fiction business. We call it anthologies. In the nonfiction, we call it collections. I don't know why. <laughs> it's one of those things. Right. So but if you think about what can I do to replace some amount of my time with an evergreen product that just continues to sell year after year. Mm. And so I should, and let me talk about this for a second. So I, somebody actually asked me, how, what are, what are your goals for this book? And I said, my goals for every single book, nonfiction mm. that I write are to sell a thousand copies in the first year. And that's, that's not a lot of copies, mm. right? That's not, I mean, it's, it's fine for nonfiction. It would be nothing for fiction. Um, and then 200 more copies every year after that mm. for the rest of my life, for the rest of my kids' lives, for the rest of the grandchildren I don't have yet. Um, right. So and when you think about it that way, it's kind of the best kind of pyramid scheme for you as a as a business. Right. So that the work you continue to do grows your evergreen passive income. Mm. Yeah, and it's it, it is interesting though with nonfiction because at the moment I I've, I've been working on this how to write nonfiction book and really thinking about a lot of these issues. One of the issues with nonfiction is 
time and how things age because you might write um you know you do agile project management or um you know there are project management methodologies and terminologies and things that actually go out of date or change or they decide they want to add some other level so that people can get you know uh, whatever the new certificate um so how do, how do you balance evergreen nonfiction with books that are going to have to be updated, which to me becomes a bit of a pain. So there's, there's a couple ways to do this. Um, the, the way I write is not, I mean, there are a couple of different things. I was trying to define run rate in a book, in a, one of my books. Mm. Um, run rate is the, is what it costs a project team for a given week. Right. So I was saying, if you have this kind of a salary per day, it's this many, this much per week. And with seven people on the team, it's that much. So um, and that's the that's kind of the only thing that's that makes it not evergreen. So people are always going to want to do good projects. Mm. Right. They're always going to have to manage their project portfolio. They're always going to have to hire people. They're always going to. They're always going to look for a job, right? I mean, you you wrote a job a, a book about that, so I think it's really important to say, what, how do I write this book in a way so that I'm not dating it, mm. right? And and I think it's, um, yeah, social media changes some things, and yet we are all human, and so when when I focus on the human interactions then that's how we say, okay, this is, this is the evergreen part. And so I often, so I'm writing a book about geographically distributed agile teams, which I'm sure everyone in your audience just, you know, it's going to rush out and buy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And their eyes goes over, but we're pair writing it, which is the interesting part. And, and we are, we have our tools in an appendix because it's not about the tools. It's how the team works together. Mm. Right. So that is the evergreen part. And then, you know, at some point there'll be other tools. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point is really to try and separate those bits that change from the bits that are evergreen. Um, no, that's that's fantastic. Well, we should we should talk more about business plans since that's what <laughs> I was just so, so interested in some of the other stuff. But we've talked about strategy. So strategy is really, I guess, the direction that we're going in and some of the bigger decisions we're making. Um, so let's get down into uh, a business plan. Um, what are some of the aspects of your one or two? To pager like what are some of the, the 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 subheadings i guess on there so i've for many years i've i've broken out the revenue from my business and i, I really want to talk about revenue mm. not units yes let's um, do that because it's it's revenue for workshops and assessments and consulting and speaking and coaching all right whatever it is i do and i don't actually is it I don't care? I don't track units. Mm -hmm. So I don't actually track the number of workshops I sell. I track the revenue. I don't track the number of books I sell. I track, I track the revenue. Um, and when I had an opportunity to make an audio book from my self-published books, I said, what's the worst thing that can happen? The worst thing is, is I need to sell another workshop to more than cover the cost of the audio. Mm. And that's what I, that's how I, I had this um, decision. So I said, okay, if I sell one program management workshop, I know I can, I can uh, cover the cost of the audio. So I did, I actually sold three. So, so it more than covered the cost of the audio. And then it turns out that making that decision, right, should I or shouldn't I, what do I need to do to cover the costs? Because um, if you don't look at the income and the outgo, you don't have a business. Mm -hmm. Then I said, okay, I'll do that. And it turns out I actually sell more audio books for that book, which then prompts people to buy the print, not mm -hmm. the ebook. If you would, say, and now this is nonfiction, it's not the same as fiction. I'm sure that fiction is totally different. But if you had ever said that to me before, I would have said, you're nuts. And 
So you're not nuts. <laughs> no, and just to, just on that, um, I've been banging the drum on nonfiction audio for a while. I think it is totally different to fiction. I've actually stopped doing fiction um, audio books because it's too expensive and it, it just doesn't sell enough unless you're a massive seller. But nonfiction readers are devouring audio books and they're not price sensitive, are they? It's just amazing. No. No, they're not. So I have I have um, more audio books to do. I am, you know, working through this and I have the rights to them so I can actually price them the way I want to mm -hmm. as opposed to the way Amazon wants me to. Yeah, that's fantastic. So we've got, and I agree with you, I'm the same. Um, I measure money. I, I, I mean, I look at my bank account pretty much every day. I, I like tracking everything and in the money sense, but I don't track numbers of books sold either. It's At the moment, it's still so much of a pain when you're wide <laughs> to track all this stuff, right? But what, what, are, what are some of the other um, things on your business plan? So it's it's how I get income, and then when I decided to stop traveling as much, how I would how I would replace income. Mm. So if I if I I have no idea what I I actually did in 2016 or 2017. That was before, right? This is now. So, but if I if I have a strategic goal of replacing this kind of revenue with this kind of revenue, what do I have to do to do that? So that's why I'm focusing on my virtual workshops, my, my online workshops, so that I can still have interaction or possibly no interaction with people and still um, replace enough of the income. And then if I'm not traveling, I am actually not that good at writing on planes. Mm. I tend to sleep. So, I mean, if I'm taking an overnight flight somewhere, I sleep. I'm not, I'm not gonna, going to work. So what do I, what else can I do for writing? So I have, I have monthly columns. I have a quarterly column in one place, a monthly column in another place. Um, and then what do I want to do for collections in my books? So I have more production because again, that production will feed the overall revenue. But, the, um, and then if it's a, if it's literally a collection, then it's not, as difficult although i'm working on a collection right now and it it's almost as difficult so yeah <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But it's interesting because I feel exactly the same way, particularly with the nonfiction side. It is a bit, bit of an ecosystem. Well, in fact, all of it, it, the same with fiction. It becomes an ecosystem and it feeds itself and just mm -hmm. kind of does that growing circle. But some of the things you're talking about there, just be clear. What is the difference between a business plan and a to-do list? Oh, oh, thank you. A business plan says, here's here is my strategy, right? Well, first of all, why am I in business? Hmm. What's my mission, right? I, I want people to do reasonable stuff that works. That's why I call myself the pragmatic manager. That's why my publishing company is called Practical Inc. That's why um, INK as opposed to INC. And that's why, uh, yeah, there's a pun there. Um, and, and that's why all of my stuff almost all of my stuff has practical or pragmatic but there's it's all useful stuff you can do now mm -hmm. from wherever you are right so that's that's really important so if you know your mission and you might if you're a fiction writer you might say um paranormal romance i'm a big romance reader right so romantic suspense that's my mission or cool stuff that happens to interesting people right? whatever it is and then that's your mission. Now you say, what are the tactics I need to do to support that mission? Um, I am not um, a one book a month writer either. <laughs> that's That just seems huh, difficult. Um, but what do I need to do to do that? And then you have, then and especially what mix of products and services so the plan is in the products and services. The to-do list is how you implement those products and services. Mm. So just um, so a line on your business plan is um, 
put this book into audio so insert book name here and i think that's important yeah. like the specific specificity <laughs> be specific about the 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 project you're doing on the business plan but then the to-do list would be um you know uh hire a narrator for example it, uh, yeah. hire a narrator does not go on your business plan no no it's it first it's the decision to say go audio with this mm. Yeah, exactly. Right. And maybe the reason why you've made that decision. And I keep coming back to this reason why, because in the last couple of years, I've dipped my toe into a few things. So I dip my toe into maybe having a publishing, you know, like a, I, I have a small press and I dip my toe into, is it more than just me? And then I backed away from that because I felt like, do you know what? My number one value at the very top of the business plan is freedom. My, you know, I want freedom. And if I become a publisher, I don't have freedom. So there, Therefore, it doesn't fit with my plan. Um, so that would be, uh, you know, an example of, of kind of why you need to write down the reasons mm -hmm. why, I guess. And, it, and the other thing that people will say is, oh, I don't need to write it down. It's all in my head. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> oh, I think that's nuts. <laughs> so, so sorry, all you people who think in their heads. <laughs> I think in my head, too. Yeah. And until I write it down, it doesn't get done. So it's really important. Now, and I'm not saying that everything you write down gets done, right? You and I were talking before about how I fast switch. So I have a system that kind of looks like Agile and Lean where I work on one small thing at a time. And my one small thing is anywhere from 20 minutes to half an hour. I might write a section in a nonfiction book. Um, I cannot write a chapter that long, um, that fast, but it could be a section or two. Um, I might write a blog post. I might write a column. I might do any number of things, but I can always get something done in about 20 minutes, maybe half an hour. And because I do that, I can make progress on several fronts. So I have a proposal for a, a given client. I have workshops to do. I have talks to finish. I have this kind of blogging and that kind of chapter in a book. I want to make progress on all of that. And so that I write, I write down what I want to do this week. But if I didn't write it down, how would I ever know what I want to do? And it's, it's even more important at the, at the strategic level. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have a great business, you got to write down what you're going to do for your business. Now, that does not mean you get to beat yourself up if you don't accomplish everything that you wanted to write down. I'm not a fan of beating myself up. I'm not a fan of anyone else beating themselves up. I am a fan. Okay, so we are back for what is the last third of the interview. Now, something went wrong and cut off our previous conversation. And I wanted you to talk a bit here, Johanna. Well, one, what happened? And two, what can lessons can people learn about when things go wrong in a semi-live situation? So we had the tree guys here cutting down the trees so that in a storm, they wouldn't come over and take the house and take the electricity and take the Wi-Fi. And, of course, the tree guys took the Wi-Fi. <laughs> they just got, they cut right through it. And so I texted you so that you would know. Well, I texted my husband, who is not here, who emailed you. And luckily, you had a great sense of humor about this. And then, <laughs> and then we replanned for a different day. And this is exactly what we do in our businesses. Exactly. Because things don't always go right. Um, and, and I use a form of planning called rolling wave planning, which means I plan for a certain amount of time. I deliver what I plan to deliver. And then I plan for the next bit of time. So we had a very short rolling wave. And we replanned. And we're back here. Yeah, we're back, I think, like four days later, because between us, you know, we figured it out. And and I think this is really important, too. So um, for everyone listening, I've had 
I had one particular podcast interview where nothing recorded and I didn't realise until afterwards. And that this was seriously four or five years ago now. And ever since then, I am incredibly careful and I'm constant. I, I don't record this all in one go. I record different batches. So what happened when we got cut off, I was still able to rescue what we had already. And now we're finishing off. So why this is actually a great podcast episode to talk about it because the plan we were talking about business plans and the plan is not set in stone is it like we come up with a plan and then life happens oh it certainly does i mean even if it's a small thing like an interruption for wi-fi that i got back you know 48 hours later something like that but what i often see is a I want to change the course of my business or I don't finish something I thought I would finish. Oh, gee, this never happens to anybody. And and I want to replan what I'm doing. So I was thinking about how can I coherently explain what I do. So I have, I have either a piece of paper or now I use a Google Doc because I can always look at my Google Doc. I don't have to be at home to look at my piece of paper. And I say, plans for this year, right? Mm-hmm. And that's it. And then I, I have another line underneath that for my my consulting, my nonfiction career, which is what do I want to be known for? And for my fiction, what do I want to be known for? Mm-hmm. And so I'm not, I, I mean, you and I both have wide businesses. Not only are our books wide, but we have a varying number of things. We do workshops, we speak, we write. It's fiction, it's nonfiction. There's all kinds of stuff. So it's really important to say, at least for me, what do I want to be known for is as much of a mission statement as I'm going to get to. Mm. I, I don't need to spend days and weeks deciding my mission. It's just not worth it. And then, I know you're so surprised. And then <laughs> and then I break it up by quarters. What do I want to achieve in a given quarter? Because that allows me to say, what do I want to achieve in a month? Now, these are not detailed plans. This is a list. Mm. And I might even, so for this year, I wanted to do three nonfiction books. And one is a collection and the other two are, are actual writing. And I've been blogging about this stuff, so I have some material, but it's not all of the material I need. And I have a fair amount of writing to do. And my nonfiction books are, I try to keep them to 50,000 words, and I don't always succeed. <laughs> so so they they go longer, and I still have my blogging, and I still have my quarterly and my monthly columns. I mean, I, and I have work as a consultant. So I really have to adjust as I see what I'm doing and actually what I'm able to finish. Mm. And I think that's so important. Like uh, an example for me right now is um, this how to write nonfiction book, which I had planned. I had thought it wouldn't take that long and it's taking so much longer than I expected. And then I had some life stuff happen and, and I'm really glad I actually allowed a buffer. I think it's the first time I've given myself a month buffer, but even to get things like the print format done, like oh. the ebook is easy enough, right? When we format ourselves using vellum or whatever, but getting the print formatting right with nonfiction particularly Particularly the formatting, don't you find the formatting is so complicated with nonfiction when you have so many subheadings and all, all the different things. So the print, and I've just done a workbook and I'm doing an audio book and all these products, it takes so much longer. So one thing I did want to ask you is, you talk a lot about project management, you're an expert in this project management niche. What, what are some of your tips for authors about project management? Because indie authors have to be project managers. Oh, yes. So... I really like action plans where I'm going to say, what is the first small thing I can do? What is the next small thing I can do? Because I am I am very big on um, crossing stuff off my list. I happen to use a form of personal Kanban. I know, sorry, I'm using jargon. Um, but that just allows me to see all of the work in progress and where it is. So if I have several columns on my board, which is um, what's ready for me to do, what's in progress, if I'm waiting for editing, if I'm waiting for feedback, if I'm waiting for review, and then done. So it's a very simple board. And for me, it really works because this way I can really monitor 
what do I need to do today and this week? Because I only plan for a week at a time. Mm -hmm. And how much work in progress do I have? So I, I suspect that many of our writing colleagues have a lot of work in progress, right? We have a short story here. We have a novel there. You and I both have nonfiction books, and I have a ton of very nonfiction. Almost every writer I know has a lot of work in progress. Mm -hmm. So what, what is the smallest thing I can make progress on and still finish, especially today, tomorrow, and this week? Mm. It, and I think that it's so what we've done really in this interview is we've gone from the strategy, which is a sort of life direction and a business direction down to the business plan, which might be one page with a couple of bullet points down to the project plan. And each book is really a project. I think that's what I love about being an author. I was trying to think because talking to you, I don't talk to many consultants anymore. And one of the things I love about the consulting life is it's very much uh, project based. Mm -hmm. And when you finish a project, you can like take that off and say, I did that project. And many people's CVs in the consulting world are based on the number of projects they do, um, project life cycles rather than, I don't know, years or whatever. So it's so interesting. I think there's so much, um, you know, similarities. Uh, so and I wanted to ask you, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see from, uh, from indie authors that you think that you, you can see because of your business expertise? Oh, they, they think they have to write 5,000 words a day all week. I mean, I'm, I'm very big on writing for 15 minutes at a time. I can finish a very short blog post in 15 minutes. I can get partway through an article in 15 minutes, enough so I know where I'm going to be tomorrow when I pick it up. But it's for me, it's the consistency. I write for at least 15 minutes every single day, and yes, it really is every single day because I'm I really like the streaks. I am I am a streak person. And if I, it's the same with my Fitbit. If I walk every day, I write every day. It's I uh, I keep my streak going. And I I I really like that. Mm -hmm. Now, not everybody does. But if you if you don't say to yourself, I have to get a chapter done. Oh, that's a horrible thing. Right. But if I only have a scene or a section I can actually get that done. Mm. Do you have a, a streak tracking thing? Do you have an app or a checkbox or something? I have an Excel spreadsheet. Ah! Woohoo! Uh, Old I know, you're so surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so, my daily word count, and I have five different columns because I'm doing all this stuff. I know, I know. I'm a little, um, I, wa I want to use a word that I don't think I should use with a mic. <laughs> so I'm a little... Um... Retentive. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. There I'm a little retentive about that. And I, I actually discovered that tracking my words helped me write more. Mm -hmm. So for me, it really works. It does not work for everybody. So don't do it if it doesn't work for you. But for me, it really works. That's interesting because I don't. Um, I think people assume that I do. I don't know why, but they often assume I'm better at these things. Um, I, I'm not really. Uh, what I do with my iPhone, I track my my steps. So my step count. So a bit like, more like the Fitbit. Um, and what I have trying, I'm trying to do is track um, breaks which is because I'm very bad at taking breaks. So my husband said, rest is not something that happens when you're totally exhausted. It's something you're meant to do in between. <laughs> so I, I was going to ask you, because I want to ask you now about your health, um, your health issues. So you have a, yeah. dif a different blog uh, called createadaptablelife.com. So just um, tell us, because you're obviously achieving so much in these 15 minute blogs, but you also have a health <laughs> issue. So how do you manage your health issue and being a healthy writer and your consulting business? Okay, so I, I had this inner ear hemorrhage in 2009, which left me with total deafness in my right ear and which actually has a side effect. I sleep really well. 
I roll over into, onto my hearing ear. I do not hear my husband snore. So my sleep has improved tremendously. However, I do have vertigo because I blew out the vestibular system in my right ear. So I use a rollator. I look like a little old lady. I mean, but no, I don't know I'm, what that is. Explain what that is. Oh, um, it's a four wheeled walker. Oh, okay. So. So you actually saw me with it when we were in Oregon at the writing workshop. Well, the business class. I didn't workshop. even notice. So, I didn't even oh, notice. Well, <laughs> it folds up. Uh, once I get to my seat, it folds up. It sits right there. It's next to me. It's some. It's. I have a wonderful. It's not one of those old lady walkers with tennis wheels on it, right? This is. I can actually stride. I can actually walk with it, which mm. is a really good thing. So. I have chosen not to travel as much because I have found that when I travel, I don't eat right, I don't exercise right, I don't walk enough, except in the airport, right? In the airports, you walk a lot. But mm -hmm. it's really hard physically to maintain my health when I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. So I, I really pick and choose where I travel and when, and I'm... I'm, I don't go to Minnesota in the winter anymore. Um, for those of you who don't know, Minnesota gets even more snow than Boston. It's always cold. My relatives, my husband's family is from there. So I've, I've said to them, not in the winter, only in the <laughs> summer. So, so I really manage this and I find that when I'm home, which is more of the time, I take more frequent breaks the good thing, I, I I don't know if people have seen. I've I I drink a variety of things. I have iced tea with lunch. I have um, seltzer after in the afternoon. So I'm always drinking. And the nice thing about always drinking is you have to get up every so often. Mm. And the for me, the more frequently, the better. So I always. I can always decide to do, uh, especially in the winter, should I do a few hundred steps while I'm up right now? It's only a few minutes. And so I, I can maintain my health and I can maintain my walking mm -hmm. and I can maintain all of my exercise regimen while I'm doing my work. Mm -hmm. so, and so, yeah. so the, um, the vertigo, which can you just describe what that is because i think some people think oh it's that woo woozy feeling you feel if you're up high but people I, and i have a family member also with it so i understand but why is it so debilitating oh so the kind of vertigo i have is not bppv which is benign proximal positional vertigo where your crystals fall out of your ears mm. no I have a special kind of vertigo. I, I have because I have no vestibular ocular reflex. When my when my head goes up and down, my eyes don't track properly, and especially when my head goes side to side, my eyes don't track properly. Now I am on great medication, so better living through chemistry. So I you cannot actually see this unless mm -hmm. I had specific goggles and a dark room and all that stuff. Um, but the effect is when I bend over um, either front or back, I get quite dizzy and I don't actually know I'm headed for the floor until I'm on the floor. So I sit down to tie my shoes. I sit down to get dressed. I, I watch my husband get dressed in the morning. He stands there on one leg and pulls up his pants and I think, when was the last time I did that? Oh, I don't know, years ago. So there are many things I cannot do. I cannot run, I cannot dance, I swim weird. because <laughs> I <laughs> Your head off in I, one direction or something. <laughs> well, so I only do the breaststroke and I, I can no longer do the crawl because I can't turn my head that fast. Mm. So there's, there's a lot of things I can't do. On the other hand, I have a big mouth, right, so I can talk. I have big ideas so mm. I can write. And so that's what I've been focusing on since since the vertigo really got worse and it gets it gets a little bit worse every single year which is unfortunate but it's what i have so 
Mm, mean I yeah and it's yeah I think this is a really important thing because I think that writing I mean health issues either your own health issues or other people in your family's health issues this is something none of us can avoid in our life um it this happens to either ourselves or someone we love or both or whatever um and being a writer means that you can write well, hopefully either you or, you know, you can do something that can still, you know, help um, in that time. So on createadaptablelife.com, what, what are some of the things that you've um, learned, I guess, from the fact that you're such a high performing consultant and also somebody with a health issue? Like, has anything stopped you? Have you had negative comments from clients or like, how has this, how has this changed things? So I do warn my clients that I use a rollator. Before I use the rollator, I said to them, I use a cane and I always look like I'm a little bit drunk. I promise you I'm not. So, so I mean, I warn people because if they don't know, it's really a shock. Mm, they judge I, you for your physicality, yeah. not your brain. Right. So, um, but what I have found in Create Adaptable Life is that there's, I have I have two audiences. One is people with the vertigo problems, because I, I have several pages about um, inside a vertigo attack and seven things you can do to manage your vertigo, and those get a lot, a lot of hits. And the rest of the time, I only blog once a week with a question of the week. Because I have found, I mean, for me, questions really kind of prompt all these ideas and feelings and and synergy right i can take something from here and relate it to something there and i didn't even know that until i started to write the question so i i find that it allows me to explore in these in these personal essays a different form of writing because it's a personal essay as opposed to more of the teaching stuff I do on jrothman.com mm. and and more and not even any of the fiction so it's yet a, th a third way of writing and secondly it really helps me clarify when I'm thinking about myself mm. which I find really helpful so uh, and and the people who comment are all really nice <laughs> Yeah, and supportive because other people with health issues probably or loved ones with health issues. And I think that's really good because what you've and why I really have enjoyed talking to you is you do have these different types of writing. You have the pragmatic manager, which, you know, some people are never going to read that stuff and other people are going to love it. And then you've got your fiction and then you've got the, the health side of you and you're incorporating writing into every part of your life, which is amazing, really. Well, it's fun. And as you said, I can do it. So I can do it on an airplane. I can do it uh, even just on my iPad or in a, in a notebook. I can do it at my desk. I can do it when I travel. Um, even when I'm at, in some place where I, it's really, really loud because I have tinnitus in my right ear, right? That poor right ear. It's just, it's just horrible. Um, but that way I can, I can give myself a little bit of an escape mm -hmm. with my writing and then come back to everybody. And I find that that's really helpful. Fantastic. Well, look, um, tell us, uh, oh wait, one more question. You do teach virtual workshops, don't you? So tell people yes. where they can find you and a bit about your workshops and everything you do online. So everything is on jrothman.com, J-R-O-T-H-M-A-N.com, because I got my .com, you know, back when it was fine to have your first initial and your last name. There weren't that many URLs. I know. Oh, well. Um, everything is there, and I'm, I'm in the midst of revamping my online workshops so that I make the videos shorter. <laughs> and I make it more bite-sized chunks so that people say, I could take a six-week workshop or a four-week workshop, and it would it would be fine. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on that, and I will be offering, I offer nonfiction writing workshops. Um, the first is getting the habit of writing. The second is getting the habit of publishing. Mm -hmm. And the third, possibly fourth, I'm, I'm still working this out, is about book writing. Because I, I suspect that you, like many of my friends, um, you, you, you do the nonfiction book thing. This is about these um, 
you know, every every consultant wants to write a book. Oh yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so and they all they all have funny ideas. So I want to help them make reasonable choices for them, right? Everybody has their own set of choices. Mm -hmm. So how do you make your choices? How do you finish the damn book and get it out, right? Uh, everybody I know has at least two or three books in progress. Well, in progress is too many. Done is what we want. Fantastic. Well, that's a great place to finish. Thanks so much for your time, Johanna. That was great. Thank you so much.